Uh, let me double check that. Yep, okay, we are recording. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the material then, uh, since there are no questions. Um, well, I guess before we do that, though, before we do that, let me uh, let me just mention a few things. And let me, um, whenever I share my screen, I always lose chat. So let me bring that back in case there are any questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was given the information about the uh, virtual uh, tutoring available through the Department of Mathematics. Um, so if you, uh, when you log into Web Campus, you should see a new module here at the very top. That is tutoring information. If you click on this, um, these are the virtual math tutoring clinic hours that is um, done by the uh, math department. And um, again, just just because of the current situation, all of the tutoring services for uh, that are through the Department of Mathematics are uh, virtual uh, for the semester. Um, so they have their uh, hours here, uh, Monday through Thursday, they are open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and you can uh, join the Zoom meeting there. So they're using Zoom as well. Um, uh, one thing that you do have to just um, be aware of with this is uh, they might need your, uh, your name, your NG number, the course, so that's Math 120. The section, this section is 1013. Um, the instructor's names, that would be Dane Bartlett uh, when you log in. So just be aware that you will need that information. And while I am thinking about that too, um, just as, as a quick note, um, whenever you are sending me an email, um, most of the, well, I guess for some questions, it doesn't really matter, but most of the time it will help out uh, quite a bit if you also include the section number that you are in, since this is uh, this is not the only uh, Math 120 course I teach. So if you can just include the section number, um, if you forget, that's no big deal. Uh, it just takes a little bit extra time to uh, verify which class you're in, uh, since the classes are on different days, they go at different times. So, um, and I have uploaded the. Uh, uh, chapter one, so this is the week two module. Uh, there's going to be a page here which will have this recorded lecture as well as the lecture on Thursday and the lecture notes. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and jump to the material then with that being, being mentioned. So I'll bring up my digital paper here. Oop. And my computer is yelling at me, but that's all right. Okay, um, so we're in section 1A. Last class, we went through the first uh, seven logical fallacies that we had listed. We uh, remember we're looking at 10 specific fallacies uh, in this textbook. And so we went over the first seven of those. Uh, so maybe just as a, as a quick reminder, so last class, Um, we defined, well, okay, I'm already having problems pushing the wrong buttons. There we go. Last class, we uh, defined an argument. So remember, an argument, uh, at least in terms of mathematics, what we are talking about in this, uh, in terms of logic, is... Um, consists of two things. It consists of a premise or premises. There can be multiple ones, which are evidence to support, which are facts or assumptions uh, that you're using as evidence to support a conclusion. So um, it consists of a premise or premises. There can be multiple which are the uh, evidence that you are presenting, uh, which you hopefully are using to support a conclusion. And remember that is what you are arguing, that is what you are trying to convince uh, the other person or the other party, the other group is correct. And we also went through uh, 
the first missing an H there first uh, seven fallacies that we listed. Okay, so today, then we're going to start with the eighth fallacy that we listed, which is circular reasoning. So uh, fallacy number eight, circular reasoning fallacy. Now there are a couple of different ways to uh, formulate this. Again, it depends on uh, what reference you're using or even the textbook that you're using. Uh, I'm gonna try and uh, as closely as possible stick with what the book uh, uses, the way the book uh, defines things. Since uh, I do want you to read through the section, I wanted to reinforce what is being taught. Um, Oftentimes, a lot of the other definitions and things are perfectly valid and end up being the same thing logically, but that's, again, that's, that's a little bit too in-depth for, for what we're, we're going through. So I'm just going to stick with, with um, the way that the book defines things. And so for this fallacy, what happens is the premise and the conclusion are saying the same thing, or the same statement. So let's uh, write that down for our notes. The premise... and conclusion are the same statement said, ooh, that's not how you, that is not how you spell that, said, in two different ways. Okay. And with this one, I'm going to stick with what the book used for the example. So this one, uh, let's look at the argument. Uh, you must obey the law. because it is illegal to break the law. Okay, so this is the example of an argument using circular reasoning. Uh, so again, as last time, we're going to identify what is the conclusion what is the premise? Um, I prefer to start with the conclusion, but if you, uh, when you're doing your homework or studying, if you prefer to find the premises first, that's fine. Um, in this case, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is you must obey the law. That is the conclusion. And what is the argument? What is the evidence for that? Well, because it is illegal to break it. That is the premise then, that is our evidence. But um, let's look at these two statements. You must obey the law is the first statement. The second statement, it is illegal to break the law. Those are basically the same statement. They're saying the same thing, just uh, said in a different way using using different words. So in this case, that is circular reasoning, an example of a circular reasoning argument. Uh, any questions on this example or anything up to this point? Okay, uh, then we will continue. Again, I'll keep my eye on chat, but we'll continue until I, unless and until I see a question. Uh, so nine, the ninth fallacy we're going to look at is uh, diversion, the diversion fallacy. Uh, which is sometimes called the red herring fallacy. Oh. Okay, there we go. Sorry, my computer, uh, the program froze for a bit. So this is the 
uh, red herring. And what occurs in this fallacy is uh, the person making the argument uh, is attempting to divert attention from the real issue by focusing on another issue. And oftentimes uh, those will be related. The um, conclusion and the premises will be related, uh, but you'll notice that, that it will uh, be focusing on different issues. So let's write this down. Uh, so this argument attempts to direct the attention from the real issue or the, uh, that is the issue that is being discussed by the conclusion statement uh, by focusing on another issue. And again, oftentimes uh, these issues will be related, uh, but they will not be they will not be the same. So let's look at an example then for the diversion uh, fallacy. Okay. So the example for this one. Good grades are needed to get into college. And a college education, a uh, college diploma, let's say, college diploma is necessary for a successful career. Therefore, attendance should count in high school grades. Okay, so here is the argument that is being made. Good grades are needed to get into college and a college diploma is necessary for a successful career. Therefore, attendance should count in high school grades. So first off, uh, what is the conclusion for this argument? What are, what are we arguing for? Uh, fellow attendance. Good, uh, particularly what about attendance? like going to school every single day, maybe even when you're sick or can't. Right, and that it should count in high school grades. Excellent, so that is our conclusion. Very good. Okay, and then what are we using as our premises, as our evidence for this conclusion? And so, College diploma is necessary for a successful career. Good. That is one premise. College, uh, a college diploma is successful for a, is necessary for a successful career. So we'll call that premise one. And, and good grades are needed to get into college. And good grades are needed to get into college. Excellent. So that is premise two. Okay. So notice we have two premises and a conclusion. Um, if you wanted to, again, you could, prob uh, you could probably combine those two premises, but that's not, uh, we don't want to get too deep into that. All right, so notice the conclusion, what we are focusing on is attendance. Attendance should count in high school grades. That is our conclusion. Well, let's look at our premises. Premise one, a college diploma is necessary for a successful career. What about that is attendance? There is nothing mentioned about attendance there. So that is a completely different issue 
the completely different issue there is that a college diploma is necessary. Again, it's related, but it is not the same. It's not a, it's, it's not the uh, attendance, uh, uh, the issue of attendance. And premise two, good grades are needed to get into college. Again, that is related, but nowhere in that premise doesn't mention attendance. We're not talking about attendance in that premise. We're talking about good grades. So in this case, for the, the uh, two premises, they are not at all focused on attendance, which is our conclusion. And so we're kind of uh, diverting the focus away from attendance in making this argument. So it is the uh, diversion fallacy. Okay. And uh, number 10, the 10th fallacy we were going to look at is the straw man fallacy. Okay. Now this one is uh, different from all of the other nine fallacies we've talked about in this section, because in this fallacy, uh, there are actually two arguments uh, that are needed. So um, the first argument is going to be uh, one that is given by an opponent. Let's say, take for example, you have two politicians running in the same race. One of the arguments will be from what the first politician. And then the straw man uh, comes from the second argument. And what happens with the second argument is you are refuting a distorted view A distorted view or a completely different argument than the one that was given. Uh, given by an opponent, let's say. Okay, and for this one, let's look at example 10 in the textbook that is on page nine. And so to save on time, uh, I went ahead and pulled up the uh, e-textbook. Let me find the right tab there. Uh, let's see. Ah, yeah, okay, so here on page nine, um, here is example 10. So this is the example we're going to go through. So we'll read it through first and then we'll discuss how the, uh, the fallacy takes place. And I also want to mention, notice here on the margins, um, these are the things that I talked about, uh, the image and the um, summary of, uh, in this case, this is the diversion fallacy. If you scroll up here is the circular reasoning fallacy. So. Um, that's what I mentioned last class. Okay, uh, but let's let's focus on example 10. So example 10, suppose that the mayor of a large city proposes decriminalizing drug pro pro drug possession. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, can't English today, apparently. Uh, decriminalizing drug possession in order to reduce overcrowding in jails and save money on enforcement. So notice that is the first argument that is given. The mayor says we should decriminalize drug possession. And the uh, premises for that, his evidence is, well, um, number one, it will reduce overcrowding in jails. And number two, it will save money on law enforcement. That is what he's using to support his conclusion, which is we should decriminalize drug possession. Okay, so that's the first argument. Uh, his challenger, so the person that uh, is running for mayor in the upcoming election, says, the mayor doesn't think there's anything wrong with drug use, but I do. So notice the, the person that is not the mayor, that is running against the mayor, says, well, the mayor thinks there is nothing wrong with drug use. That's why he wants to decriminalize drug possession. Is that a true statement though? Is that what the mayor's argument was based on? What was the mayor's argument based on? No, it's not true because the mayor was, the mayor was uh, 
was saying that if you decriminalize, decriminalize drug possession, mm -hmm. it, it'll reduce overcrowding in jails and save money on enforcement. He did not say that he approved of drug use or possession. He just saying if you de decriminalize it to make it so it isn't a crime anymore. That is it's exactly a completely different thing. Exactly correct. Yes. So notice that the distorted view here is well, his challenger it doesn't even look at the reasons why the mayor wants to. He's just saying, well, the reason why he must want to decriminalize drug possession is because he doesn't think there's anything wrong with drug use. But notice the mayor didn't say anything about whether drug use was good or bad. He just said, well, if, if you decriminalize it, you're going to reduce overcrowding and save money on law enforcement. So the opponent is using a straw man, is uh, refuting a distorted view of his opponent's argument. Very good. Okay. So let's go back to our digital paper here. Uh, and so again, that, that was a lot to write. Uh, so to save time, I, I just wanted to um, go through that. Uh, now, the very last part of this, of this section is on uh, five steps for evaluating uh, media information. Um, this next part, uh, I'm not going to test on. This won't be on the exam. Uh, this is going to be in the homework. There will be, I think, if I remember right, there are two homework problems on this. Maybe one. I might have dropped one. I want to say two, though. Um, so let's let's go through that. So again, this one is not going to be on the exam, but it is in the homework. So I wanted to go over what those five steps are. So here are five steps, and this is given by the author. Uh, five steps to evaluate. And uh, the author says media information, though this could be used for really any information. So I'm going to put media in quote and uh, sorry, in parentheses here. So when you're evaluating um, some information or a media, uh, let's say an article, uh, number one, step one, you should consider the source. Where is the information coming from? Is the source reputable? Um, step two, Check the date. What is the date of the article? Uh, some things like take, for example, um, medical research can change uh, as time goes on. We might not know a lot about a specific type of medical issue. And that, that uh, um, as time goes on, we learn more. Uh, depending on when, say, a certain article is published, it might be using outdated information so what is the date of the article? Uh, exam uh, st sorry, not example, step three. Step three, uh, validate the accuracy. Can you validate the accuracy given in the article? Uh, can you find one, two, three, maybe four other sources that give you the same information, but that are from, you know, not from the same source, not from the same article? Uh, can the information be validated? Uh, step four, watch out for hidden agendas. So watch for hidden agendas. Is there a specific reason, a hidden agenda, why this article may have been published? And this one is, is difficult because sometimes hidden agendas, um, well, hidden agendas can exist in, in the human subconscious without someone realizing it. So it becomes difficult sometimes for that. And uh, step five, don't miss the big picture. So don't get too caught up in the details uh, and lose what the big picture is. And so um, these are the five steps that the author, I guess authors give for evaluating information, like take, for example, an article. Um, if we go back to the textbook, let's go back to the textbook really quickly. I think this is on the next page. Um, and sorry, I have, to move, I have to move these windows so I can go to the next page here. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's this, it's this blue box. Um, so he goes, uh, the authors go into a little bit more detail here. 
Um, but that is that is where this is coming from. And again, this is uh, just for the homework. I'm not going to be testing on these five steps, um, but it is useful to to uh, have at least one way to evaluate information. Uh, in this case, uh, media information or information given in an article. All right, so that is section 1A. So 1A is now complete. Um, so now that we have finished the, uh, the lecture on 1A, the reading check, um, let's see, the reading check and the homework for 1A will be due this, this coming Sunday at 11.59 p.m., um, which will be, let's see, what day is that? January 31st. Um, and I know there are there are some of you that have contacted me that were having some uh, some issues with uh, registering for Pearson. That's fine. Um, let me know as soon as you get the Pearson account set up, and we'll we'll extend any homework. Um, since that that's the way life is sometimes. But uh, if possible, we'll let's let's uh, set that for January thirty first. Um, all right, uh, we're skipping section 1B in the textbook. 1B, go, again, we're, we're looking at a broad scope um, of, of a lot of information. We're not going too much in depth. Uh, section 1B goes into a lot more depth um, into logic and reasoning. So if you were uh, taking, take for example, if you were uh, taking a, a class on, uh, just a class on our making arguments and logical uh, and logic, or uh, take, for example, a, a class on philosophy, then you'd go through 1B, but we're gonna skip that section. Uh, so the next section that we have is 1C. Now 1C is going to feel like it's a little bit of a detour because uh, we are uh, looking at sets and Venn diagrams. That is the focus of 1C. So this is on sets and Venn diagrams. And it is a little bit of a detour, but we are actually going to be using uh, Venn diagrams in the very next section in section 1D to evaluate uh, arguments, to figure out, um, to, to uh, analyze arguments in a, in a closer way. So, um, a little bit of a detour, but a necessary one. So let's start with a set. What is a set? A set is a collection of objects. And it can be any collection of objects. Um, and the objects don't even necessarily have to be uh, concrete objects. They can be things like ideas or uh, abstract things, and we'll we'll see a uh, few examples of those. Uh, just as a note, we're going to sometimes call these categories. So, at least in this textbook, uh, categories and sets are going to mean the same thing. So, a category is a collection of object, or a set is a, uh, sorry, category is a collection of objects or a set is a collection of objects. We'll use those two words interchangeably in this textbook. Uh, the members of a set members of a set are the specific objects uh, within it. So are the specific objects in the set. Or again, we can interchange that with uh, the word category. And one more thing before we look at an example, we list uh, members of a set so we can uh, we can write out a set as uh, take for example a list members of a set. in between all right let's see sorry i gotta wait for my program to catch up in between 
uh, curly braces. So those are these, uh, which you can find on the on the keyboard. And we call that uh, set notation. Okay. So let's look at a quick example for a set. Um, let's go with days of the week. Um, let's be more specific. What are what are the days? Uh, days. of the work week, we'll say, of the standard work week. Well, there's Monday. Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, exactly. Monday, Tuesday, so let's list those out. Tuesday, Wednesday, <clears throat> Thursday, and Friday. Exactly right. So this is our set. It has five members, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Is, uh, is Saturday a member of the work week set? No. Excellent, yes. So I'm seeing that in the, in the chat response. Uh, we can also define another set. We can say, what is uh, the weekend or the standard weekend? Again, um, this might depend on your work, but I'm saying uh, standard for most nine to five jobs is Saturday and Sunday. Because it, yep, that's that's exactly right. Yep, Saturday is not a, is not a member of the work week because it is included um, well, it's either you can include it as a weekday, which would be all seven days, or as a, as a weekend day, a day of the weekend set. OK. So this is a quick example of a couple of sets. Uh, now we can use sets for any kind of different things. You could have, uh, take, for example, sets of movies, sets of um, numbers, if, uh, most of the time. When we're talking about mathematics, we'll be looking at uh, sets with mathematical objects, but that's not always the case. Um, so now let's look at Venn diagrams. So uh, a set is a collection of objects. A Venn diagram is a visual representation of a set, so or uh, multiple sets. Let's write that down. So Venn diagrams, which are named after the uh, mathematician John Venn, I believe. Yeah, John Venn. Venn diagrams uh, are a simple way to graphically to graphically represent a set, or we could do multiple sets uh, using a circle. Or if we're looking at multiple sets, circles. So if we uh, look at what we had before and uh, oh. let's see. No, there's a way to draw a circle. There we go. All right. So if you look at the previous example here, we can have a set. Let's call this uh, weekend. Then inside of the set here, we have two members. We have Saturday and we have Sunday. So this is a Venn diagram. Um, so we use every, every set in a Venn diagram is represented by a circle. And oftentimes we will use uh, a rectangle or square like so to represent 
the universe. So this is what we're going to call the universe. So here we would have uh, the other days, Monday, Tuesday, and we could have other objects as well that are not uh, days, but this is an example of a Venn diagram using the previous, uh, previous set that we defined. So a Venn diagram is a graphical way to represent a set. We will often um, contain a Venn diagram inside of a box or a rectangle, which the box or the rectangle represents the universe. And any of the set, uh, any of the sets that we have represented graphically will be represented by a circle. So we can have multiple sets um, represented by multiple circles, which we will see in the uh, in the coming. Uh, well, that's what we'll be doing next. Okay. Uh, now there there are three set relations or relationships that are going to be important for us. Uh, so let's look at those in a little bit of detail. So there are three set relations or relationships. Let's call it relations. And the first one that we're going to look at is subset. All right. So for a subset, uh, we say uh, set A is a subset of set B. Now, um, we usually use capital letters to represent a set. Uh, and just because we are just uh, getting used to sets, I'm going to call this set A and set B. But oftentimes, uh, they will drop the word set and they'll say A is a subset of B. Um, if every member of A is a member of B. And we can represent this in our Venn diagram. So let's Let's draw our universe here. And we can represent, oops. And we can represent this as a circle inside of a circle. So here is our first set, here is our second set. So here is set A. And here is set B. So that's how we represent this in terms of a Venn diagram. Every member of A is a, is a member of B. So an example of this uh, would be something like, let's say, let's, let me scroll down a little bit. And we'll use, I'll use the same Venn diagram, but I'll label this, uh, we'll label this as blue. So an example would be cats are a subset of mammals. So anything that is a cat, so take for example, a lion or a panther and so on. So this is a, a cat is also a mammal. But we have mammals that are not cats, like uh, take for example, a bear and so on. So this is, uh, this would be an example of a subset. So the set of cats is a subset of the set of mammals because everything that is a cat is also a mammal. So it is a subset. Uh, maybe I should ask, are there any questions up to this point? Let me just double check and see how you guys are feeling about, about uh, sets so far and Venn diagrams. Oh, there's a thumbs up icon. I didn't even know they had that. Cool. Feel good about it? Okay. All right. So 
I will keep my eye on Chad again, uh, but well, let's let's continue on then. Um, so that is our first set relation or relationship is a subset relation. Sorry, subset relationship. Relation, relationship, uh, basically the same thing. Number two, the second relationship or the second relation are disjoint sets. So here, disjoint sets. And let's go ahead and I'm going to uh, drop the word set. So instead of set A and set B, I'm just going to say A and B. So A is disjoint from B if they have no members in common. And let's draw what the Venn diagram for this would look like. So here we have our universe. And let's draw our sets. Here would be set A. And here would be set B. And these are going to be uh, completely separated because anything that is a member of A is not a member of B, and anything that is a member of B is not a member of A. Uh, so an example of this, let, let's uh, look at a, an example of this, of disjoint sets. Um, mammals, the set of mammals, and the set of reptiles are disjoint sets or disjoint. Uh, again, you can drop the word set there, but let's let's uh, let's have that there. Our disjoint sets. Uh, any animal that is a mammal is not a reptile, and any animal that is a reptile is not a mammal. So those are disjoint sets. Okay. And the third relationship we have is overlapping sets. So the third relation we have is overlapping okay. and the way that we're going to define this one is A and B are overlapping sets if they have some member in common. So A and B are overlapping sets if they share some member. All right, so again, let's draw our Venn diagram first. Get our universe and then our sets. Uh, so overlapping sets, there's going to be some member in common. So here is uh, set A, here is set B. And just to emphasize this, we're going to have something here. There is something in both sets. something here. All right. Continuing with our example. Of using animals. Or sets of animals. Um, cats. And domesticated animals are overlapping. Uh, is an example of two overlapping sets. Whoops. 
don't know what happened there. Okay. Uh, so let's say if, if set A, let's say these are the set of cats. And again, we have our lion, we have our panther, and have our tiger. Uh, here we would have our house cat. That is a cat. And B will say our domesticated animals. Well, a house cat is a domesticated animal or at least for our arg arguments it is. I'm sure that house cats would disagree. Uh, but we'll also have uh, chickens, dogs, cows, things like that. So those are domesticated animals, but are certainly not cats. And then we have uh, cats that are not domesticated, uh, absolutely, like lions and panthers and tigers. Um, but there is something in common in both sets, in this case, the house cat. So that is the uh, third relationship we have, overlapping sets. Okay. Any questions up to this point? No questions? I'll keep my eye on chat. Um, all right. So the next part of this, these set relations will come back and uh, they're going to be very important in section 1D. So we're going to be using these, um, these relationships, these uh, set relations, when we are looking at uh, evaluating arguments in the next section. Uh, that's going to be one of the keys to evaluating, analyzing a, an argument in, in detail. Uh, but before we get into the meat of that, Let's look at uh, sets of numbers. Okay. So we're going to uh, do a little bit more with uh, sets of numbers. So again, this is most of the time when, you, when we're looking at um, mathematics, we, we're going to look at sets of mathematical objects. In this case, sets of numbers would be a good example. Um, and this is often one of the one of the things that you'll find in any um, any mathematical textbook, usually in the first chapter. Uh, and this textbook is no different. This kind of gives you a, a second idea of or a, a, another example to look at in terms of not only sets but set relationships. Uh, so let's look at sets of numbers. Now there is a figure on page 30. Uh, it is labeled figure 1.15, which uh, summarizes this, but it doesn't do it in, in very great detail. Uh, so I want to be a little more specific about that. We'll build this up to uh, the figure. So what we're going to do, I'm going to write down the sets. I think we have about six of those, yeah six sets of real numbers. We're going to write down what they are and list them out. And then we're going to look at how they're related and that will uh, give us our figure, which is the Venn diagram of these sets of numbers. Okay, so the first set are the natural numbers. And the natural numbers, we start with one, then we have two, three, four, and so on. So whenever we have a set that uh, we can't possibly list every, um, every member of, we're going to use the ellipses, the dot, 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 to um, indicate that this goes on. So we also have five, six, seven, eight. Uh, one million would be a natural number as well. Just keeps going. Um, next set are the whole numbers. And the whole numbers, we're actually going to start with zero. And then we have one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay. Uh, the next set will be the integers. And this one, we're going to throw in the negatives. So we're going to put a dot, dot, dot here negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. And 
as soon as my program catches up, three dot, dot, dot. Okay. So here we can put this on both sides to indicate that this pattern continues in both directions. So here on the right-hand side, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. On the left-hand side, we'll have negative one, negative two, negative three. We could have negative four, negative five, negative six, and so on. So it goes, it continues in, in both directions. So we'll have the uh, dot, 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 the ellipses on both sides. Uh, next are the rational numbers. So the rational numbers are numbers in the form x over y with x and y integers. And here we have to be a little bit careful because we can't divide by zero. So we're going to say y is not zero because that's going to break mathematics and we don't want to do that. Or at least, uh, please don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't break my subject. Don't divide by zero. All right. Uh, after that, we have the irrational numbers. And the irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as x over y with those being integers. And so a couple of examples of irrational numbers, just, just to give you an idea. Um, pi is an irrational number. It, can, it cannot be written as uh, a fraction of integers as x over y. Any kind of uh, radical that does not simplify. So square root of two, uh, cube root of five, those are irrational as well. So any, any number uh, that any radical number that cannot be simplified. Um, and I'm out of room, so I'm gonna need one more uh, so let's go to our to a fresh page here. So let me zoom in and just the page. And then the last set that we have are the real numbers. Which is any number that is rational or irrational. So those are the real numbers. Let's go back to the first page, the previous page. So these are the six sets of numbers. And we'll be referring to these. Um, these will show up from time to time throughout the later sections. So we'll say, well, this number is a natural number. Or this number is an integer. Um, so it's a good idea to be familiar with it. Uh, but let's look at how are these sets related. So these are, these are sets. They are collections of objects, in this case, collections of numbers. And so they are related in some way. We can um, look at the three previous set relations uh, and de determine which one of those three uh, is the relation here, whether they are subsets, uh, disjoint sets, or overlapping sets. Um, and let's look at just the first two sets. So here, we're just looking at natural numbers and whole numbers. I'm ignoring all of the other sets of numbers. We'll come back to those. How are the natural numbers and the whole numbers related? Would the natural numbers be a subset of the whole numbers? That is exactly right. Yes, the natural numbers are a subset of the whole numbers because any anything that is a natural number is also a whole number. You'll notice the whole number we have for the whole numbers we have an extra number in this case that is zero. So let's let's go ahead and start our image here, our Venn diagram for the numbers. So here. Let me see if I can draw this. 
Uh, I'm not sure how big I want to make this. Let's go with that size. So here are the natural numbers. So we have one, two, three, whoop, three, four, and so on. And this is a subset of the whole numbers. The whole numbers, anything that is a natural number is also a whole number, but we've included zero. Zero is now included in the set of whole numbers. Excellent. Okay, so that's the beginning of our Venn diagram. Let's go back. So now let's focus on the uh, next two. So we'll have look at whole numbers and uh, integers. How are these two sets related? Any brave souls? Would uh, whole numbers then be a subset of the integers? That's exactly right. Yep, the whole numbers are a subset of the integers. Because notice, anything that is a whole number is also an integer. But the, the, the integers contain more numbers. Notice we have added in now the negative numbers. So let's add to our Venn diagram here. So we have another, this is, uh, these are, the whole numbers uh, are a subset of the integers. And here we've added in the negative. So we have negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. Okay. And now let's look at the next two. So we have integers versus rational numbers. Oh, hold on one second. Okay, so we have uh, integers and rational numbers. And so you'll notice the pattern that we've had so far are subsets and, and you might wanna say, well, this is a subset. Um, rational numbers, we have any kind of uh, fraction of integers. So we could have like one third or uh, seven fourths, things like this. Question is, uh, can I write, let's pick, on, let's pick on the number two. Can I write two here as a fraction of integers? And if so, how would I do it? I'll give you a hint. Two over one? Yes. The answer is yes, that is the hint, good. And the way you do that is two over one. So the integers are in fact also rational numbers. They are a subset of the rational numbers. You just uh, stick an over one divided by one on that. So these are also a subset relation, so let's Again, add that to our Venn diagram. So here we have the rational numbers. And now we've added in any kind of uh, uh, fraction of integers. So we have one half. Uh, what was the other one we did? Uh, seven fourths. You could also have any negative. So negative one half, negative three-fifths, so on. Those are the rational numbers. Uh, we're going to skip the irrationals. And the real numbers are any number that is rational or irrational. So certainly the rational numbers are a subset um, of the real numbers. And then let me adjust that. There we go. So here we have the real numbers. Okay, so there's one set that we've skipped, and those are the irrational numbers. So if we go back to, uh, and my window's in the way, there we go. If we go back to our sets, notice um, the irrational numbers, these are completely disjoint from the rational numbers. A number, it's either rational or it's irrational. It cannot be both. So. It might not be clear at first where the irrational numbers fit, uh, but the irrational numbers are actually in this uh, little donut area on this Venn diagram. Here are the irrational numbers. So they are real numbers, so it has to be in this set, in this circle. Uh, but they are not rational, so they cannot be inside of the rational circle. So it's in this little donut area. So here we have pi, 
as soon as my program catches up pi uh, square root two. What was the other one we did? Cube root five. Any kind of uh, radical that does not simplify. And so that, that fits in here. Um, so this is, this is the uh, figure that, that I mentioned, figure 1.15. Uh, but this has a lot more detail than what the book shows. So this is the uh, question. How yes. come, um, uh, yeah, of course, all rational, irrational are, are real numbers. Yes. But how come it's got a little donut instead of a circle of some sort? That's a good question. Um, so let me, uh, let me try and pick a, a lighter color here. So if I, oops. That's a little too light. Well, let me let me put in these lines. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to erase these. But uh, if if we look at the rational numbers, right? That is anything that is inside of this circle. So if I uh, shade this in, anything inside of this circle is rational. So any any number um, that is that is rational has to fit inside the circle, but that means that any number that is irrational cannot be in this in this circle, the one that's uh, purple. So when we look at the real numbers, the rational, the irrational numbers have to be inside of this bigger circle, but they cannot be inside of the purple circle because that would mean they're rational. So it has to be outside of this circle, but inside of the bigger circle so it so it leaves this donut shape area does that does that make sense oh i see what you're saying because uh the rational is the circle within it yes exactly uh, right so, yes so the irrational is in addition so instead of making it a disjointed circle you make it like it goes all around yep Yep, and so that is actually a, that is that is a good that is a good note. We'll come we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, so there there were a, a lot of nice things that were said there. So the real numbers, uh, in order to get the real numbers from the rational, you just add in the irrational numbers. Um, and I think it was uh, who was it the Greeks that didn't like irrational numbers that thought that they didn't exist, so they didn't really get to the real numbers. Um, anyways. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let me let me clear this out. The the purple there, the shading to make this a little clearer. Um, and so notice that even though we're, the rational and irrational are disjoint, uh, we can still have them in this Venn, in this Venn diagram without showing them as disjoint. Now, if we were only interested, let me. Um, I think I might also erase this. Uh, but this is a good this is a good point that was mentioned. Um, if I were if I if I were just concerned with those two sets, with just just the rationals, just the irrationals, no other sets of numbers. I was just interested in those two sets. Those two sets are disjoint. So what I could do is I could draw those like so. So I'd have here would be the irrational. Here would be the rational. So here would be the irrational, here would be the rational. And then from here, I would draw in the other circles. So inside of the rational, we'd have the integers. Inside of that, we'd have the whole numbers and so on. But we can draw this as disjoint as well. Um, but I think it's a... Uh, um, even though we can draw those as disjoint, when we are concerned, so let me let me erase that that uh, Venn diagram. Well, before I erase it, though. So if we were to look at the real numbers, the real numbers would be the circle containing both of those, but there would be nothing. Uh, there would be nothing in this portion of the Venn diagram that is outside of both circles. That there it would just not contain anything. Um, so let me erase that Venn diagram. But uh, when we're concerned with the, again, the big picture, especially when it comes to these sets, then this is this is more of the Venn diagram that we are concerned with. Um, 
Good. Uh, any other, those were good questions. Any other questions up to this point? Okay. Not seeing any, any questions, so. I think this is a good place to stop. Um, so we um, again, this this Venn diagram here with the uh, sets of numbers with the real numbers is a figure. Well, let's actually let's let's look at that in the book. Um, I want to show you what that looks like in the book. So that was on page thirty, I believe. Let me turn my page. I lost. <laughs> of my notes, I lost what page? Yeah, page 30. So let's go to page 30 here. Yeah, so here is here is that Venn diagram, but notice the, the one that is given in the book is a lot uh, a lot less detailed than what we did. And that's because we we built it up from from the beginning. So that is that is the same uh, figure as what we have here. So we do have this subset relationship. The only one the only odd one out are the irrational numbers. Okay, so where we're headed from here, the next part of this, the last part of this section, or I guess the last, there are two, two last parts of section 1C. Uh, one is on categorical propositions, uh, which we're, we will define in the next class. And we can write though, we can draw those as a Venn diagram. So that is, that is where we're headed. And then we'll, that, that will be directly what we'll use in the next section. And the, the, the uh, second part of 1C is getting information from a Venn diagram and uh, creating a Venn diagram uh, given information. Um, so we'll, we'll look at some examples with that. But uh, so we have a, a couple of different, uh, just two, two pieces left. It should take maybe 30 minutes of lecture and then we'll uh, be in section 1D. Um, but Again, this is a good place to stop. Um, so let's stop there for today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, and let's let me click on that first because I can find the button easier. There it is. Stop the.